Hello again, Year 11, and welcome to this next video in this little series looking at the GCSE English Language Paper 2, Writers, Viewpoints and Perspectives from November 2018. This is the paper based on cycling in the city. And today, now, we are going to look at our next question, which is question four. And there are my neatly organised highlighters, if you were concerned that I'd forgotten them. I have not. So question four is the biggest question on the reading section. It is 16 marks. So this is your heavy hitter on the reading section. Um, you need to make sure you're giving yourself enough time for this. Please allot at least 20 minutes, preferably 25, so that you can spend some time annotating and thinking about your response and give yourself enough time to write a detailed answer. So like with question two, this is a, a, a question where you have to talk about both sources. So it reminds you to refer to the whole of source A and the whole of source B. Now that's a big clue that there should be information from across the sources. Now it will give you a little prompt, compare how the writers convey their similar perspectives on cycling in the city. So we have this word compare. Now there may well be similarities, or there will be similarities here, but there will also be differences. Like with question two, if it says similarities, but you talk about differences, you will still get credit for that. You are getting credit really for your ability to discuss their perspectives confidently and to think about methods. So you get a bit more of a prompt here. It says in your answer, you could compare their similar perspectives on cycling in the city. So that's really repeating that prompt from the question. Compare the methods the writers use to convey their perspective. That word there, methods, that is one of your most important words in this whole question. And support your response with references to both texts. That is your reminder that you need to talk about evidence or you need to include evidence from both text from both articles. So when we're thinking about perspectives, obviously our paper is called Writers' Viewpoints and Perspectives, we're thinking about their opinion. More importantly, their thoughts and feelings. So these articles will have been chosen because the writers do express some quite strong thoughts and feelings. So in both of these articles, the writers are clearly, they clearly have something to say about what it is to be a cyclist in the city. So you shouldn't have too much problems or too many issues finding some clear thoughts and feelings in each article. So as we've done before, what we need to do, our first approach, our second approach after highlighting the keywords in the question is to skim back over those articles and find some evidence where they are getting across a strong thought or feeling and even better yet something where they have a clear method this is so important you have to have to have to have methods in your response Whatever the quality of your response is, if there are no methods, then you will be in the bottom of the, the level that you've reached. So say you're making some clear comments, but there are no methods there, you'll be in the bottom of the level. And if you don't talk about methods at all, then you, you will have quite a low score on this question. OK, so this time around, I have already highlighted some evidence and I'm going to take you through how I would annotate it to pick out what the viewpoint is, what the sort of tone is and what the methods are. And then once we've done that for both, we can think about where our best points of comparison will be. So in this article, we have at the beginning this list of terrifying or alarming incidents and deliberate actions of another road user. I think this sets it out as being a very serious tone or having a very serious tone.
um, this idea about the deliberate actions of another road user, it's it's almost about that relationship between cyclists and road users. So the key idea here is that relationship. And we can see that that is in the other article as well. My last such incident happened under a week ago. So this is a personal story. uses a flashback. So it's including that personal experience and we'll remember that that's in the other one as well. We will have we will have picked that up already. I was unharmed that the driver was gambling on the assumption I would not, for example, hit a sudden pothole. The tone of I was unharmed, there's nothing light about that. It's clearly making it out that this was a serious incident and that they were quite lucky to be unharmed. They're not making a joke, they're not making light of it at all, which again, you may remember, is very different from the other source. So it's quite somber, it's quite grave in terms of a tone. Inevitably, the congested traffic meant, here I think they're being quite matter of fact, And they're not they're not making it sound any lighter than it was. Um, it's also starting to build quite a detailed argument because it starts by saying they had an incident. Then it says that these incidents always end up being pointless. Then it starts thinking about um, like the responsibility of the drivers who create these pointless incidents. So it's sort of building up paragraph by paragraph an overarching, uh, overarching argument. And it's doing this again, this very serious tone. A couple of things must be noted. That use of the word must there, we have this quite commanding authoritarian tone. And they build on this through the article. So we have that modal verb there that creates that. We also have some facts and statistics to give this a sense, again, of authority, of experience. They know what they're talking about. They're not basing this on kind of a hysterical encounter. This is something that's very factual. So again, they're building an argument that seems quite credible. There's also something about the organisation here. So as I said, they're building an argument. We have a couple of things must be noted. First, second. So it's very logical. It's very ordered and organised. Now they carry on by creating this very authoritarian tone here with the thing to grasp, as in they understand and they want us to understand. So they're trying to get us to agree with them through creating this very logical, ordered, serious line of arguments. And it's, it's trying to impact the reader, it's trying to make you change your opinion. So it's persuasive. It has a clear purpose. They wanted to change their mind about road use and they're going to do it in this very clear, logical way. This is where they're developing their argument about how it's not whether you're a cyclist or a pedestrian, you're just a person. My personality is not changed or defined by any of those. So they're creating quite a nuanced argument here.
So we have quite a, a nuanced argument about road use and responsibility. In this next paragraph, we've got more facts. So again, they're layering this, um, this factual credibility. It's quite scientific. It's why police should take incidents more seriously than they generally do. So again, this is something that's quite weighty. It's something that's very serious. And now their aim has again switched slightly. It's, it's now talking about responsibility. And after building up this argument with this, these facts, this scientific approach, creating this very credible, factual, serious tone, it has, like I said, it's shifted its aim to making the reader feel responsible. And now they are urging us, I'd urge you to hold two very clear thoughts in mind. So we have the kind of advice to the reader. But the choice of the word, of the verb, sorry, urge, is it's almost like they have authority and they are responsible and they want us to be responsible. They're very moral. That we should take, we should act on their example. And this is what they're urging us to do. And again, we have this very clear signposting. The first is to also bear this in mind. They're structuring this, argu this argument very clearly. Cyclists are not obliged or even advised to ride in the gutter. They're now standing up for the rights of the cyclists. And we've got more sort of rhetorical devices going on in these two paragraphs to really hammer home the, the rights of the cyclist. So if a rider is in the middle of the lane, it could be to stay clear of open doors on parked cars. It could be because the edge of the road is rutted and potholed. It might even be to stop drivers squeezing past when it would be clearly unsafe to do so. So we have this rule of three repeated structure um, going on to emphasize that these ideas, that these reasons, that there are many possible reasons why cyclists might be in the middle of the lane and it's urging us to see that these are valid reasons. So we have this repeated Also bear this in mind. So again, we have this clearly signposted argument. Even if you're absolutely convinced the cyclist is wrong, hold back and be cautious anyway. So again, we've got advice to the reader. In the majority of urban traffic situations, your overtake will be a very brief victory. They'll pedal past again in the queue for the next red light or junction. But most of all, remember that these are human beings, unprotected flesh and bone. So we've got some emotive language going on here to emphasise the vulnerability of people, of cyclists. And this, remember, remember this. I mean, you're not going to write this or well, you wouldn't write this in a response, but it kind of reminds, it's the same tone as the inspector in the, an inspector calls. It's this very authoritarian, serious tone. We should take pity on these vulnerable cyclists. And his authoritarian tone really um, contrasts with the image that he's created of these reckless drivers. We just flick back 
just to remember that I've forgotten to, to pick one out. This writer is serious, they're authoritarian, they know what they're talking about, they can advise us, they can command, they can use imperatives. But the drivers who are being risky are gambling and they're rolling the dice. So here in terms of methods, we've got some metaphors going on. We've got this gambling metaphor that contrasts these risky drivers with this serious, responsible writer. So there are lots and lots of things that we could talk about there. And as you reread the article, whatever the article is in your exam, you should be picking out maybe three or four things that you think are the, the most important ones and keeping in mind what you think you're going to be able to link it with in the second article. So now let's look at the second article. And as you annotate this one, you can probably pick out fewer things because you'll be looking for those things that will be best to compare. So on to source B. Now, in general, this the tone of this is much more lighthearted. It's got much more figurative language, and it seems to be really playing down the risk of being a cyclist in the city. Um, so there are lots of things. There are similarities. They're both talking about how recycling can be dangerous. But really, you're going to get more, um, more mileage. You're going to be able to develop a more perceptive response if you're able to talk about the ways in which they're similar, but the ways in which those similarities start to diverge because of the tone and the purpose of this article. So at the start, we've got a new sport that has been lately devised. So this is trivialising this quite risky behaviour. Um, it's also um, And this is where she's talking about these um, drivers of the handsome cabs chasing the lady. So she's, she's suggesting it happens a lot. Um, I cannot help feeling that cycling in the streets would be nicer, to use a mild expression, if you try not to kill me. So she's being humorous here. She's being quite jovial. She's being quite cheerful. So there are lots of words you could use to describe her tone. And as I said, that's a marked difference from the other article. And where she says to use a mild expression, we've got some slight sarcasm there as well. She's almost, she's trying to be proper because, well, she's the Countess of Malmesbury and she's writing an article. Um, so she sort of needs to be proper. But there's a sense that she'd quite like to not use a mild expression. So there's a sort of, subtle uh, double meaning there. Now we've already analysed this section, you've already written about it. If you write about some of these bits again, it doesn't matter, you can write about some of the figurative language uh, there if you want to. Uh, it will be a different marker that marks your question four to your question three, so if, if you repeat yourself a little bit there, it's fine, um, but there are better things to talk about for this particular question, so you don't really need to. But this, down the end of this quote, I only recount this adventure in order to encourage others who may have had the same experience as myself. We have another personal experience, another flashback. So there's a similar method going on here. But she talks about it in a more lighthearted way and in a more figurative way. So she sort of dramatises her experience for entertainment, whereas the other writer, Walker, makes his uh, very factual because he wants to come across as serious. So when you're thinking about these articles, you should be thinking about how their purpose impacts the viewpoints that they're giving across and the methods that they use. 
It's also interesting that she uses the word adventure here. So she's portraying herself as adventurous. She is portraying herself as being this intrepid, fearless cyclist. Whereas Walker, the other author, doesn't have and that's not what his purpose is. That's not why he's writing. Next, we move on to a slightly different point where she's talking about this little book, The Guide to Cycling. Now, throughout the article, she uses various phrases which seem to be quite diminutive or self-depreciating. So this little book, um, which makes her seem fairly naive. It makes her seem as fairly non-threatening. And again, this is a stylistic choice. This is a method she is using to make her writing more entertaining and more lighthearted. And as I said, this is kind of a, a disconnected paragraph. We've got this extra bit of information. So where a source A is very logical, is developing an argument, this is a bit more like random anecdote. The other interesting thing about this paragraph is because she also talks about this idea of cyclist having rights. I had an actual legal existence on the roadway, as good a right to my life as even my arch enemy, the handsome. So we have more humour there with arch enemy. But we can see a clear link between the ideas in the article about how cyclists have rights. The next paragraph gives a uh, sort of generalisation of ways in which cab drivers inflict torture on fellow creatures. So we've got some metaphorical language there, which again emphasises this sort of battle between the cyclists and the drivers. Which is another difference. So in the first article, it's not about drivers and cyclists. They make that point that actually it's just people and some irresponsible people happen to be in cars. Whereas this writer is definitely pitching cyclists against cab drivers. If you were looking for judicious use of um, evidence, which you should be if you're aiming for a a level four response, then picking out these little words like lawful, um, a right to my life, to build up this idea that she's talking about the rights of the cyclist would be would be a beneficial beneficial thing to do. In this paragraph, she's talking about not getting squashed, so she says she wants to avoid being made into a sandwich. So her choice of metaphor is again quite jovial, it's quite humorous. which contrasts with the subject matter she's talking about being squashed. Remember, this, this actually would be quite dangerous. She's on a, on a bike, which is not like, it's not like a road bike now. It would be a fairly, um, not necessarily flimsy, but not really designed for um, serious riding on the roads. And she's talking about uh, getting stuck between an omnibus, which is a large horse-drawn vehicle, so it's and a, and a and a and a horse. So it's it's quite a risky situation, and she's really playing it down. Here again, she's being very self depreciating. I'm meekly escorted, and here she's using more metaphorical language. The wild and skirmishing jungle around me, feeling like what I may perhaps describe as a dolphin playing around an ocean liner. So we've got this metaphor to describe the street and a simile to describe herself. And she's comparing herself to a dolphin. So it's, it's quite a positive 
light-hearted portrayal. We think about dolphins as being these kind of fun, intelligent creatures. Um, they're not threatening. They're not um, they're not dangerous in any way. Um, playing around an ocean liner kind of echoes the tone of the whole article, that when she was there, she was being very, um, very frivolous in the street um, in the same way she's being frivolous with her writing. And she's comparing the, the omnibus to an ocean liner, which again, she's she's put, she's picturing or she's creating the image of quite a risky situation, but she's doing it in this very lighthearted way. And then after this episode, my life was safe, it's true, but what is life if your new white gloves are ruined? So she ends on a joke. She ends on this very, again, self-depreciating um, statement. It's meant to be humorous. It's meant to be ironic um, to sort of suggest that your new white gloves are more important than your life. Obviously, she's being sarcastic here. It also gives us an insight into her life. She obviously has lovely new white gloves and she is possibly slightly materialistic or she is um, presenting herself as being materialistic, again, to create this image of a naive, frivolous writer, this unthreatening, naive writer who is trying to sort of take you along with her experience. The tone there is also very polite, and that's a real juxtaposition between the quite brutal reality of the situation that she was in. She can, at the end of what would have been quite a severe risk to her life, make this very polite, kind of naive statement. You know, she's she's really playing into this idea that she's a non-threatening uh, woman. Okay, so at the beginning and throughout, I have made it clear that the methods are really key here. So what you have on the screen now is an overview of what the main methods are in these two texts. So both of them use structure in quite a similar way, um, or the overall structure. So they're both uh, flashbacks. They both include flashbacks and anecdotes and personal experience. So it creates this um, kind of link with the writer. They're telling you something they know about. They're, they're talking from experience. You can trust their experience. And they're trying to bring you along with something that they know a lot about. However, there is a difference in the whole text structure. Source A follows this very logical argument. They're building something that's a logical argument about making sure that when you're in a car, when you happen to be in a car, you are mindful of the fact that you are protected and dangerous and that cyclists are very vulnerable in comparison to you. Whereas source B kind of cobbles together these quite random anecdotes to create something that's a bit more jovial, it's a bit more frivolous, and it's more about portraying this cyclist as um, an intrepid, fearless adventurer who happens to get into some scrapes and um, suggests that cycling is dangerous, but that you should really give it a go. So the, their whole text structure is different because their purpose is very different. And this feeds into their tone. So the tone of source A is serious, it is factual, it's authoritarian. He is urging us to take responsibility and act. Whereas source B is frivolous, cheerful, it's ironic. It's meant to be entertaining and it's possibly meant to, meant to make us feel like we could give cycling a go as well, even if we happen to be meek, dolphin-like women. And um, they both differ in the way that they use language. So while source A does have some figurative language, it relies more on facts and statistics to suggest that it's very credible in its argument. And where it uses metaphor, it's to almost discredit the risky drivers. They're the ones gambling. They're the ones rolling the dice. Whereas source B is quite emotive, uses lots of figurative language throughout to create this sense of drama. So how are you going to structure your response? Now, there are two ways of doing this, really. You could focus it on this, compare the methods, 
and link each method to an idea. But slightly more logically is to start with the ideas. So you would have a viewpoint from A plus evidence. plus analysis of method, and in terms of the analysis of method, we should be thinking of a sort of a what, how, why. What is the method? How is it being used? How do you know? And why? Why have they used that method? Why is it effective? Um, why have they chosen to use that method in terms of the result they want to achieve? Then you would compare all of that to B. So you would have a viewpoint from B, evidence from B, analysis of method from B. And then you want to do all of that twice. So you're focusing on having two fully developed points of comparison. So the structure is in many ways similar to question two, but you're doing more with the analysis. This section, the analysis of method, should be the bulk of your answer. So at this point, you might want to pause the video and have a go at writing up your own response. Remember, you should be spending about 20 to 25 minutes on this question in total. So taking away some time for having uh, read and annotated, you're probably going to be writing for about 18 minutes. Or you can carry on watching. I will talk you through uh, my first paragraph and then you can have a go at writing one that is similar. OK, so this time round, I have written out the first part of my answer and I'm going to talk you through the thinking behind it as I read it to you and point out uh, where it would be picking up marks. So the author of Source A takes a very moral stance expressing his view that selfish idiots create dangerous, alarming incidents for cyclists through their deliberate actions. Now, in that first sentence, I am getting across what their viewpoint is. But I'm doing it in a way that's a, that's using um, judicious, that is showing judicious use of evidence by using these tiny little micro quotes to back up what I'm saying. So straight away, I'm showing that I understand the text and I can use the text in a judicious way. I'm also straight away getting in a sense of the tone and understanding the writer's tone is really important scoring highly in this question. So by saying it's a moral stance, I'm, I'm showing that I understand that this is a serious piece, which I then go on to elaborate on, because that's the method. He creates a serious and authoritative tone throughout, issuing a grave plea to the reader when he urges them to hold his advice in their minds and commands them to remember that cyclists are unprotected flesh and bone lest they too should be tempted to act in an irresponsible manner when behind the wheel of a car. So here I've got discussion of the tone. I've got my evidence to back that up. By saying it's a grave plea, a command, I'm talking about methods. I'm also talking about the purpose. So where he's commanding the, the reader to remember that cyclists are vulnerable so that they don't act in an irresponsible manner behind the wheel of a car. So I'm covering a lot in that section of this paragraph. Then I want to move on to comparing that to source B. So, and I want to try to do this in um, a way that shows I really understand the nuances in the difference in their argument. Whilst the writer of source B also feels that cyclists are put at risk by drivers, she expresses this in a humorous, almost frivolous tone. So I'm comparing the idea that they feel that cyclists are put at risk by drivers and I'm, I'm going into the method by talking about the tone. Now I haven't finished that section of the paragraph. So what I suggest you do is firstly finish this section of the paragraph 
add in some more evidence that back up this idea that she's talking about it in a frivolous way, explore that evidence, explore the method, the tone, explore her purposes for creating this light-hearted, frivolous tone, and then think about linking that together to show uh, what the difference is between these two writers. And then I would make sure that you write up another idea. So you go back to this page, and of course your annotations for each extract. You you've got lots of other things that you can talk about in these two articles. So hopefully you've got enough there to do a developed response to this question. Uh, if you have already written your response, you might want to compare yours with what I have written here. Check whether you've used evidence in a similar way or whether you could add in some more evidence to show this idea of using evidence judiciously. Um, and if you haven't done your answer yet, spend some time now writing up a response to question four. If you would like some feedback on any of the work that you have done on this paper, um, any of the work that you've done on responding to any of these videos, uh, you're very welcome to send them across to me if you'd like my opinion on them, um, having done this, these videos, or to send them to your English teacher. Uh, if you just do that via Google Classroom or drop us an email, then we should be able to give you some feedback before your exam. I hope you found this series of videos useful. If you've got any questions, please let me know. Uh, good luck with your exam on Monday and happy revising.